Hello, welcome to Notable Nobels, a podcast about the Nobel Prizes in Physiology or Medicine. My name is Harrison Doolin. I'm a postdoctoral scientist at the Fred Hutch Cancer Center in Seattle, and I will be your host for this web series. Now, the purpose of this series is to trace key advancements made in the biological and medical sciences over the past 120 years using the Nobel Prizes in Physiology or Medicine as a guide. Now, every career has its highest prize, and for scientists, the highest prize is the Nobel Prize. It's the most prestigious award a scientist can receive, and it marks discoveries that have made a profound impact on our understanding of biology and our ability to treat diseases. Today, we will be examining one half of the 2008 prize in physiology or medicine, which was awarded to Luc Montagnier and Françoise Beret-Sunussi. The Nobel Assembly at the Karolinska Institute chose to give Montagnier and Beret-Sunussi the award, quote, for their discovery of human immunodeficiency virus, unquote. We'll be going over how the AIDS pandemic unfolded at the start of the 1980s, the work scientists did to figure out what was behind the pandemic, the life-saving therapies that were developed in response to the discovery of HIV, and some of the novel strategies scientists are currently testing to find a cure for HIV infections. But first, a little bit of background on our Nobel laureates. Françoise Beret sanussi was born in 1947 in Paris, France. She was always interested in the natural sciences, even at an early age, and fancied a career for herself as a scientist. So when she started college at the University of Paris, she went looking to volunteer in a research lab. She ended up working at a lab at the Pasteur Institute that studied oncogenic animal retroviruses. She enjoyed the work so much that after finishing undergrad, she joined the lab as a PhD student, committing herself to becoming a virologist. She completed her degree in 1974, then after a brief postdoctoral position at the NIH in the U.S., she returned to the Pasteur Institute to join the group working under Luc Montagnier, with whom she would later share the Nobel Prize. She would stay at the Pasteur Institute for the rest of her career, eventually starting her own lab to study HIV. Luc Montagnier was born in 1932 in Chabris, central France. His childhood was marred by the Nazi occupation of France. During the war, he and his family were very malnourished, and their house was partially destroyed by a bomb in 1944, though no one was hurt. The sufferings of the war inspired Montagnier to study medicine. He enrolled at the University of Pointers, studying both medicine and the natural sciences. After graduating, he got a job as a lab assistant at the Sorbonne University of Paris and later became a PhD student at that institution. He later would say that during this time his research was not productive at all, but he did gain an interest in virology. So after finishing his PhD in 1960, he went to the UK to work as a postdoctoral scientist at the Institute of Virology in Glasgow. His work there was much more productive, and in 1965 he returned to Paris as the laboratory chief of the Institut Curie before joining the Pasteur Institute in 1972 to start a new viral oncology research group in the Department of Virology. His group, which grew to include Beresanusi in 1975, studied oncogenic retroviruses found in animals, and their team was one of many virology groups hoping to find retroviruses in human tumors. However, their research goals shifted dramatically in the 1980s with the rise of the AIDS pandemic. So now, where to begin talking about the HIV-AIDS pandemic, which was the most alarming infectious disease outbreak of the second half of the 20th century? We'll start the story in the year 1980, with a huge milestone that was reached by the global medical community. On May 8, 1980, the World Health Organization officially declared the eradication of smallpox. This was huge. It was the first and to date only example of a human pathogen completely wiped out from the global population. Scientists and physicians everywhere cheered the accomplishment. Many saw it as the finest example to date of the triumph of science over disease. They had many other examples to look at, there was a growing arsenal of highly effective vaccines against other deadly diseases, including polio and yellow fever. The development of antibiotics had slashed death rates from common bacterial infections. And the use of pesticides had eliminated malaria from many countries where it used to be endemic. The euphoria around the news about smallpox eradication caused many people to boast about the conquests of man over infectious diseases. One year later began an event that caused us 
to check ourselves. The story of AIDS begins in 1981. In June of that year, a paper was published by the United States CDC describing an unusual group of five pneumonia cases, including two deaths, that had occurred in the last eight months in the Los Angeles, California area. Now, pneumonia cases are not that unusual. Pneumonia is an infection of the lungs, and there are a ton of pathogens that cause pneumonia that doctors are used to seeing. Things like influenza virus, respiratory syncytial virus, and streptococcus bacteria all commonly cause pneumonia. What was weird about the five pneumonia patients in Los Angeles was that they all had pneumonocystis carinii infections. So what's that? Pneumonocystis carinii is a fungus that up until that point only rarely caused pneumonia. Let me give you an idea of just how rare these infections were. The only drug available to treat it was considered experimental and could only be given out by the CDC. In the 13 years prior to 1981, the CDC had received a grand total of just two requests for the drug. So the fact that all of a sudden, there were five cases of pneumonocystis carinii pneumonia all in the same city and within eight months of each other was weird. On top of that, the cases of pneumonocystis carinii that the CDC had documented prior to 1980 had all occurred in patients who were immunocompromised, meaning their immune systems weren't working properly. This included people with known inherited genetic diseases or people undergoing cancer radiation therapy. But the five patients in 1981 were all young adults with no known history of immune complications. Nonetheless, by the time they showed up to the hospital, they were all diagnosed with severe immunodeficiencies. In an effort to find some link between the patients, the authors of the paper noted that all five individuals were homosexual men. Beyond that, they were at a loss to explain why these previously healthy individuals had become so sick. Then just one month later, the CDC published a second report describing an unusual group of 26 patients with Kaposi's sarcoma, and eight of the patients had died by the time the report was released. Kaposi's sarcoma is a cancer caused by infection with a herpes virus called HHV-8. In healthy individuals, the infection causes cancer extremely rarely, but now, all at once, there were 20 cases and all in previously healthy young individuals. However, the patients in their report were all immunocompromised by the time they received their cancer diagnosis, and interestingly, they were also all young homosexual men. As the year wore on, more and more cases of the unusual immunodeficiency syndrome were reported, not just in the United States, but also in Europe. It seemed likely the new disease was some kind of sexually transmitted infectious disease, a particularly deadly one. Cases of the unusual immunodeficiency continued to climb rapidly. In 1982, the disease was finally given the name we use today, Acquired Immune Deficiency Syndrome, or AIDS for short. People began noticing AIDS in additional groups, not just homosexual men. AIDS cases were reported among intravenous drug users and among hemophiliac patients who received blood transfusions. This quickly led to the hypothesis that AIDS was caused by some pathogen present in the blood, and scientific teams began searching for the pathogen that might be the cause of AIDS. The hunt for the AIDS pathogen mainly involved two groups of scientists. One group was headed by Robert Gallo at the National Cancer Institute in the United States. The other group was Montagnier's group working out of the Pasteur Institute in Paris. Both groups had been studying retroviruses prior to the start of the AIDS outbreak. Gallo's group had become widely recognized in virology circles after they discovered the first human retrovirus in 1978. The virus was named Human T-Lymphotropic Virus, or HTLV, and in 1982, Gallo's group reported the discovery of a second human retrovirus they named HTLV-2. Both HTLV-1 and HTLV-2 are rare viruses that generally don't cause serious disease. Interestingly though, both viruses infect cells of the immune system, specifically T cells. This was interesting to Gallo because the main immunodeficiencies seen in the AIDS patients was a lack of a type of T cell called helper T cells, or CD4 positive T cells. Gallo wondered if AIDS might be caused by a new retrovirus that infected T cells. He set up a team of scientists to investigate the hypothesis, a team that later collaborated with Montagnier's group in Paris. 
The U.S. and French teams were following the same line of reasoning, and they had the necessary tools and experience needed to test their hypothesis. But it was the French team that made the first report of the novel human virus that would eventually have the name HIV, human immunodeficiency virus. The opportunity to isolate the virus came when a French homosexual male who had recently traveled to the U.S. sought medical attention after showing early symptoms of an infection, including swollen lymph nodes. Montagnier's group took a biopsy of his lymph node, ground it up, and added the tissue sample to some fresh T cells in a cell culture plate. They then checked the fresh cells under an electron microscope to look for any virus that might be present. Sure enough, the researchers saw virus particles budding from the cells. They purified the virus and ran a test to see if the virus contained the reverse transcriptase enzyme, and it did. This meant that they had isolated a human retrovirus from the patient. But was it a novel virus, or had they just rediscovered HTLV-1 or HTLV-2? The group took antibodies specific for the known HTLVs, and the antibodies failed to react with the virus the team had isolated. This meant that they had discovered a brand new human retrovirus, a virus that later came to be known as the human immunodeficiency virus, HIV. Finally, the authors saw that the new virus not only infected, but also killed newly infected T cells. This allowed them to make the bold claim that the new virus might be responsible for the T cell deficiencies observed in AIDS patients. Barre Sanussi and Montagnier's group published their discovery in the journal Science in 1983. In their paper, while they make clear that the new virus might be responsible for AIDS, they also state plainly that, quote, the role of this virus in the etiology of AIDS remains to be determined, unquote. In other words, they hadn't actually proven that HIV causes AIDS. The report only showed the virus was present in a single patient, they needed to conduct a wider clinical study to test people for the new virus. If the new virus really was the cause of AIDS, then it should be found preferentially in AIDS patients and not in healthy people. It was Gallo's group that provided this evidence in a series of papers in the journal Science in 1984. One of these papers screened serum samples from 49 patients with AIDS and 186 heterosexual healthy patients to check for the presence of antibodies against HIV. 88% of the AIDS patients were positive for HIV antibodies, while only one person in the healthy control group was positive for the virus. Additional papers from other groups around the globe reported similar findings, and as reagents for detecting HIV improved, HIV became even more closely correlated with AIDS. The epidemiological evidence that AIDS was an infectious disease the high correlation between the presence of HIV and AIDS and the ability of HIV to kill T cells in culture was compelling evidence that HIV was the cause of AIDS. By the end of 1984, most of the scientific community was convinced that the global AIDS pandemic was really a global HIV pandemic and virologists everywhere took up the challenge to do something about it. I'm going to spend the rest of this episode dealing with five questions that scientists were interested in after HIV was discovered. Number one, how does HIV spread from person to person? Number two, how does HIV cause disease and death? Number three, can we make a vaccine that blocks HIV infection? Number four, can we make antivirals to treat HIV infections? And finally, number five, can we develop a cure for HIV infections? So question number one, how does HIV spread from person to person? Well, even before HIV was discovered, it was clear to most scientists that AIDS was a sexually transmitted disease and that the biggest risk factor for acquiring AIDS was having multiple sexual partners. Even today, HIV is primarily spread through sex, particularly among men who have sex with men. In fact, two-thirds of new HIV cases in the United States are among homosexual men. Heterosexual transmission of the virus is also common, but occurs at a much lower rate in the United States compared to male homosexual transmission. Several explanations have been suggested as to why the virus spreads more readily during homosexual intercourse. One possible reason is that the anal tract has a much thinner epithelial layer compared to the vaginal tract, which increases the risk of damage during sex. Additionally, the anal tract and the rectum have a much higher proportion of immune cells compared to the vaginal tract, meaning the rectum has more HIV-susceptible cells. 
In both hetero and homosexual transmission, HIV in semen gains access to immune cells that patrol the epithelial tissue. These immune cells can migrate back to the blood, spreading the virus to the rest of the body and to more immune cells. Because the route of transmission involves HIV in the semen gaining access to the mucosal surfaces, condom use is a highly effective method to prevent the spread of HIV. While sexual transmission remains the dominant route of transmission of HIV in the United States, there are a few other routes of transmission. One additional way HIV can be spread is through contact with contaminated blood. At the start of the AIDS pandemic, HIV transmission through contaminated blood was a huge concern because about 5 million people in the United States each year need blood transfusions. Then in 1985, a commercial blood test for HIV was released that allowed donated blood to be screened for the presence of HIV, which basically eliminated the threat of HIV transmission during blood transfusions. However, blood-borne transmission of HIV is still occurring today in the form of needle sharing between users of intravenous drugs. And this form of transmission makes up about 10% of all new HIV infections in the U.S. Finally, an additional source of HIV transmission is what we call vertical transmission, the infection of a fetus or infant from the mother. Birth is a very bloody affair, and a baby born to an HIV-positive mother can be exposed to a great deal of HIV during birth. Additionally, infants born to HIV-positive mothers can acquire HIV infections from breast milk. While vertical transmission of HIV is almost unheard of in the United States thanks to antiviral drugs, it remains a huge problem in countries where access to those drugs is much more difficult, particularly in Africa where over 90% of vertical transmission of HIV occurs. So to summarize, HIV is transmitted primarily through sex and more easily during anal sex, but also spreads through contact with contaminated blood, such as during needle sharing, and can also be spread from mothers to their infants. Let's move on to our second question. How does HIV cause disease and death? Well, we mentioned earlier that HIV is really good at infecting a type of immune cell called T cells. More accurately, we can say that HIV infects and kills a type of immune cell called the CD4 positive T cells, also called the helper T cells. The immune system is your body's defense against pathogens and invading microorganisms. If we compare the immune system to something like a military, the helper T cells are like the generals. They direct the other cells of the immune system towards the pathogen, and they activate the other immune cells when the pathogen shows up. Now HIV infects and kills these helper T cells. Once an HIV patient's CD4 positive helper T cells fall below 200 cells per cubic milliliter of blood, they are diagnosed with AIDS and are immunodeficient. The actual time course from initial HIV infection to progression to AIDS varies quite a bit. Some people, particularly children, progress to AIDS within two to three years after HIV infection, while some rare adults can hold out for 20 years or longer. But on average, without any pharmaceutical interventions, an HIV patient will progress to AIDS eight to 10 years after initial infection. So what does having AIDS mean for the body? Now, on the one hand, your body can function just fine without helper T cells. By that, I mean that your lungs, your brain, your digestive system, your liver, your kidneys, all of your organs will pretty much function as normal. On the other hand, AIDS leaves your immune system like a military without any generals. The other immune cells can't function properly without the helper T cells. The lack of helper T cells leaves the body incredibly vulnerable to infection, including infection with microorganisms not typically associated with disease in healthy people. This special group of microbes are called opportunistic pathogens, and they include organisms like Pneumonocystis carinii that we mentioned earlier. Opportunistic pathogens are microbes that normally don't cause disease, but in immunocompromised patients, they take advantage of the lack of functioning immune cells to start an infection. In AIDS patients, the immune system becomes so incapable of fighting off invaders that even the mildest infection can become life-threatening. So, and this is the important part, what actually kills an HIV patient isn't acutely the HIV. Even when an HIV-positive person has progressed to AIDS, the fact that they have AIDS 
isn't the immediate cause of death, though it is responsible for their death. The immediate cause of death from HIV AIDS is an infection with some other pathogen that the body's immune system is incapable of getting under control. That opportunistic infection can either kill the AIDS patient directly, like with pneumonocystis carinii pneumonias, or indirectly, like the Kaposi sarcoma caused by the oncovirus HHV8. But no matter what the pathogen is, it poses a life-threatening risk for the AIDS patient. To give you an idea of just how deadly HIV AIDS is, here's some scary statistics. Since the start of the AIDS pandemic, it is estimated that over 84 million people globally have been infected with HIV. Of those 84 million, nearly half of them have died from AIDS-related illnesses. Wow. In the early wave of the AIDS pandemic in the United States, over 80% of the AIDS patients diagnosed before 1985 were dead by 1988. That is a scary high mortality rate. So it's not surprising that the AIDS pandemic caused a lot of panic in the 1980s as people clamored to do something to stop the steady increase in AIDS deaths. But what could be done? Well, there were several non-pharmaceutical interventions that people could put in place immediately. People were warned to limit their number of sexual partners and to use condoms during sex. The ability to screen patients and donated blood for HIV also marked progress at curbing new HIV infections. But in addition to these interventions, what people really wanted was a pharmaceutical method to stop the spread of HIV. And the main intervention that people were initially interested in was a vaccine. So that brings us to our third question, can we make a vaccine against HIV? Well, at first people certainly thought so. Following the discovery that HIV causes AIDS, the US Secretary of Health and Human Services boldly told a group of reporters that she expected a vaccine to be ready for testing within two years. Well, we are now many decades since then, and there is still no AIDS vaccine. In 1997, US President Bill Clinton set a national goal to develop an AIDS vaccine within 10 years. Well, Clinton's deadline has come and gone, and we still don't have a vaccine. Many famous scientists, including David Baltimore, who we mentioned in the previous podcast episode, turned their attention to making an HIV AIDS vaccine, but almost all of them have given up on the project. Then in 2007 came one of the biggest setbacks to AIDS vaccine research. An HIV vaccine developed jointly between the NIH and the pharmaceutical company Merck failed spectacularly in a large phase 3 clinical trial. Since then, interest in an AIDS vaccine has dropped considerably, though several people are still working on the project. But why so much failure? Why is it so hard to make a vaccine against HIV? Well, there's a few reasons. One reason is that vaccines are supposed to train the immune system to fight off specific pathogens, but in the case of HIV, the immune system itself is what's being attacked. Additionally, making an HIV vaccine is difficult because HIV is a retrovirus and can establish latency inside infected cells. So what do I mean by that? Well, when HIV gets inside a helper T cell, the HIV reverse transcriptase enzyme converts the virus's RNA genome to DNA. That DNA copy is then inserted into the DNA of the host cell. Rather than making more virus right away, HIV can lie silent in the T cell, only to become activated years later when the T cell is stimulated to replicate. This ability of HIV to hide out in the DNA of the host cell keeps it from being detected by other immune cells in the body. Finally, making a vaccine against HIV is difficult because HIV has one of the highest mutation rates of any human virus. The mutation rate is so high that it is not unusual for an HIV-positive patient to develop their own unique strain of the virus over the course of their disease. Making a vaccine that can target all the different strains of HIV out there is the holy grail of HIV vaccine research. Most of the current vaccine methods have focused on eliciting antibodies against conserved domains on HIV proteins, basically targeting regions that don't mutate so quickly. Whether these approaches will work remains to be seen. In the meantime, though, a vaccine to protect against HIV doesn't seem to be on the table anytime soon. So in the absence of an effective HIV vaccine, people had to look for alternatives to block the virus. This leads us to our fourth question, can we make antivirals to treat HIV infections? 
Fortunately, the answer here is a resounding yes. There are many highly effective drugs that target HIV, but getting them took a while. The first FDA-approved drug to treat HIV AIDS was azetothymidine, or AZT for short. AZT began distribution in 1987, nearly six years after the first reported AIDS deaths in the U.S. AZT was originally designed as a cancer drug back in the 1960s, but when it didn't work against cancer, it was shelved until the 1980s when researchers began screening known drugs that might have an effect against HIV. AZT belongs to a class of drugs called nucleoside analog reverse transcriptase inhibitors. As mentioned in the last episode of this podcast, reverse transcriptase synthesizes a DNA copy of the RNA genome of the virus, and that DNA copy is then used to make more RNA genomes that get packaged into new virus particles. In the process of making viral DNA, reverse transcriptase takes DNA building blocks called nucleotides and strings them together to form the new strand of DNA. To the reverse transcriptase enzyme, the AZT drug looks a lot like a DNA nucleotide building block, and reverse transcriptase will try to use AZT to make viral DNA. However, AZT has a chemical modification that prevents new nucleotides from being added to the growing DNA strand. The result is that reverse transcriptase fails to make the DNA copy of the virus genome, which blocks virus replication. In the initial studies of patients taking AZT, the drug greatly extended the time it took for HIV-positive patients to progress to AIDS. It was an important first step, but there was still some problems. AZT had a rather high toxicity, and additionally was priced at $10,000 per year, which is about $25,000 in today's currency. That was prohibitively expensive for most people. AZT patients also often still progress to AIDS as the virus would develop resistance to the drug over time. On average, the drug could delay progression to AIDS by about two years. These problems meant that despite the approval of AZT in 1987, AIDS deaths in the U.S. continued to climb rapidly. In 1994, AIDS became the leading cause of death for Americans between the ages of 25 and 44. But in 1995, a new class of drugs completely changed the field for HIV treatment. These drugs were called protease inhibitors. The HIV virus, in addition to using reverse transcriptase to replicate itself, also uses an enzyme called a protease. The protease inhibitors were also able to block virus replication. However, just like with the reverse transcriptase inhibitors, HIV would develop resistance to the drug and the patients would still eventually progress to AIDS. Then in 1996, a new strategy was proposed for treating HIV. Quite simply, researchers proposed that if a person took a combination of different anti-HIV drugs that blocked different processes of the virus life cycle, it would be much more difficult for the virus to develop resistance. So starting in 1996, HIV-positive patients were given a drug cocktail of at least three different antiretroviral drugs that targeted at least two different stages of the virus life cycle. The results were stunning. There's a very cool graph that you can look up that shows AIDS deaths in the U.S. from 1980 through the present. You can see that after 1996, the number of deaths from AIDS just plummets. Patients on the combination therapy saw levels of HIV in their blood drop so low, the virus became undetectable. And even more importantly, the patient's T-cell counts returned to normal, meaning they were no longer at risk of developing AIDS. The combination therapy works so well that HIV-positive patients that have an undetectable level of virus almost never see the virus develop resistance as long as they continue to take their medication. And to top it off, Studies have shown that patients who have their HIV levels suppressed to undetectable levels are no longer capable of sexually transmitting the virus, and the chance of mother-to-child transmission during birth drops to less than 1%. Thus, in the absence of a vaccine, antiretroviral drugs are the most effective medical intervention that we have at reducing the spread of HIV and stopping AIDS deaths. While 30 years ago, an HIV diagnosis used to be a death sentence, Thanks to these drugs, HIV-positive patients can now fully expect to live well into their 70s with very little side effects from their medication and almost no risk of spreading the disease to anyone else.
So with all that being said, let's move on to our fifth and final question. Can we develop a cure for HIV? As amazing as antiretroviral drugs are, they do not result in a cure. In fact, while the annual number of new HIV infections and AIDS deaths in the U.S. has declined rapidly since 1996, the number of people living with HIV infections has continued to climb. This is because as things stand now, if a person contracts HIV, they will be infected for life. If an HIV positive patient who is undetectable stops taking their medication, they will have high virus levels in their blood again after a few weeks. The reason for this is because the antiviral drugs do not eliminate HIV DNA from infected cells. The drugs keep the infected cells from making more virus so the person's immune system can recover, but the body maintains a reservoir of infected CD4 positive T cells that still have the virus genome. And the problem is, some of those infected T cells can live for decades. The presence of this reservoir of latently infected cells makes developing a cure for HIV very difficult, but not impossible. The first announcement that an HIV-positive person was cured of their infection came in 2008. The patient was Timothy Ray Brown, a man from California who had been HIV-positive for 11 years. In 2006, he also developed acute myeloid leukemia, a type of blood cancer. To treat his cancer, his doctors proposed radiation to wipe out his blood cells, including most of the HIV-infected T cells, followed by a bone marrow transplant to replenish his blood. Beyond just giving him a bone marrow transplant, his doctors decided to go one step further and gave him a transplant from a patient with a special mutation in a protein called CCR5. CCR5 is a co-receptor on T cells for HIV infection. People with a rare homozygous mutation in CCR5 are about 100 times less likely to be infected with HIV. The mutation is most commonly found among people with European backgrounds, but even in that population, only about 1% of Europeans are homozygous for the mutation. Despite the rarity of the mutation, the doctors treating Brown found a bone marrow match who also had the mutation in CCR5. Following his radiation treatments and bone marrow transplant, Brown stopped taking his antiretroviral medication and the doctors waited to see what would happen. As months and then years went by, Brown's blood continued to show no traces of HIV. Even over a decade after he stopped taking antiretroviral therapy, he continued to show no trace of the virus. He had, incredibly, been cured of HIV. Now, as exciting as that was, Brown's case was quite exceptional. In fact, it's been 15 years since Brown's bone marrow transplant, and only two or three other people are known to have been cured of HIV. The reason it's been so difficult to replicate Brown's cure is because bone marrow transplants are incredibly risky operations that aren't a practical solution to HIV when antiretroviral drugs can effectively stop a person from progressing to AIDS. Additionally, even if a person ends up needing a bone marrow transplant, Finding a match is tricky, so radiation and bone marrow transplants aren't a practical solution to curing people of HIV. But Brown's case showed researchers one thing, a cure was possible. His case galvanized researchers to find a cure. So what are some of the new strategies people are pursuing to cure HIV? Well, I think the coolest strategy is using gene therapy. Gene therapy has grown in popularity in recent years as tools like CRISPR-Cas9 have made gene therapy much easier. One line of gene therapy targets uninfected T cells and aims to genetically engineer them to make them highly resistant to HIV infection. A second line of gene therapy targets the virus DNA in infected cells. This strategy aims to make mutations in the virus genome to prevent the virus from replicating. These strategies are still being tested, but I'm really excited to see where they go. Now, I have one final takeaway for this episode. The story of HIV AIDS is a testament to the ingenuity of science, and it shows that great things are possible through the hard work and collaboration of scientists around the world. But the story of HIV AIDS is also a warning to scientists not to get too full of ourselves. 2023 will mark 40 years since Moltonier and Sanusi published their paper first describing HIV. 
40 years on, while the death rate from AIDS has been falling steadily, the number of people living with HIV continues to climb, and we still do not have a vaccine to prevent HIV infections. In an article for Scientific American in 1987, Robert Gallo made the following remark about the story of HIV AIDS. Quote, Does this terrible tale have a moral? Yes. In the past two decades, one of the fondest boasts of medical science has been the conquest of infectious disease, at least in the wealthy countries of the industrialized world. The advent of retroviruses with the capacity to cause extraordinarily complex and devastating disease has exposed that claim for what it was, hubris. Unquote. If the AIDS crisis was a wake-up call about the inadequacies of current medical science, the SARS-CoV-2 pandemic has been a blaring siren. As great as science is, the threats to life are numerous and constantly changing, and ultimately, we need to keep our expectations of science in check with that reality. Of course, I'll still be telling the great stories of science on this podcast, and I hope these stories inspire scientists out there to dream big, work hard, try new things, and find out what amazing things are possible. But I also hope these stories inspire us to do our work with humility, a humility that comes from looking at our history and learning from it. That concludes this episode of Notable Nobels. This episode was recorded on February 20th, 2023, I want to thank Digital Mind Productions for providing the music. If you want to know more about the history of HIV AIDS research, I recommend the book HIV and AIDS, A Global Health Pandemic by Scientific American. Next time, we'll be talking about a Nobel Prize awarded for the discovery of another human virus, this time an oncovirus. Unlike the oncoviruses we talked about so far, this one has a rather different mechanism by which it causes cancer. Want to know more? Well, listen next time to find out. Thanks so much for listening. See you then.